All right, ladies and gents, welcome to this week's GEO Talk. Thank you once again for joining us. It's great to see you all. And it's uh, very wonderful to welcome Scott McClelland to the GEO Talk audience, but also to our staff, because uh, he's joined us in the last month. Correct, Scott? So welcome. So thank you for offering to give a talk so we can all get to know your research. Scott uh, was a PhD student at Princeton, and before that did an MSc with uh, Martin De Witt at UCT, and he's undergrad there as well. And after doing his PhD at Princeton, which is going to be part of the topic of his talk tonight, he then went on to do a postdoc at the University of Arizona. Arizona. Yes. So, uh, and then he's joined us just a month ago. So, thank you, Scott. Over to you. Oh, everything is ready. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, so today I'll be discussing some of the uh, work that I did during uh, my PhD. And, you know, we were basically, what I'm going to be describing today is how do we use uh, geochronology to kind of constrain climate uh, 750 million years ago in the past. So uh, it's, it seems like a bit of a, um, uh, a bit of a tenuous link, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you that we can say something uh, very interesting about it. So uh, what you can see in the photo here is, um, is uh, a photo from northern Ethiopia, where we're actually standing on a glacial dimectites uh, that are about 717 million years old. And uh, we're in the middle of a fold. And if you look uh, uh, south, you can actually see in the, in the distance, those are actually uh, 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 dimectites in the, in the cliffs far in the distance. But those are actually um, from the Paleozoic. So, so I thought that was a, a cool comparison. But um, what I'll be describing today is how do we integrate field geology, structural geology, and uh, you know, stable isotopes and, uh, uh, and high precision geochronology to constrain uh, Earth's climate uh, far in the, way back in the past. So, uh, uh, there we go. Okay. So, um, I'll just quickly talk about, you know, Earth's long-term climate stability, right? So, if, you know, one of the amazing things, right, is that there are sedimentary rocks basically as far back as you can go in Earth's past, right? So on the left is a photo of um, a sandstone uh, from the Bogdan at Greenstone Belt. That's about 3.2 billion years old. And you know what, what, we, uh, what we typically take from that information is that there's been liquid water on the Earth's uh, surface for you know, the last 3.5 billion years. Um, you know, so, so that's kind of a cool constraint because it means that we've never exceeded 100 degrees Celsius, right? That, that would mean that all the water evaporates. And, you know, these sandstones from the Moody's group in Barberton, you know, look somewhat similar to what you might find on a beach today. So, you know, uh, and, and, and that's not really, uh, that, that doesn't have to be the case, right? If we look uh, elsewhere in the solar system, if we look at Venus, you know, uh, the surface of Venus right now is about 450 degrees Celsius, which is, I think is kind of crazy because that means we're in bincha species metamorphism on the surface, right? Um, and in comparison, you go to Mars, right? You, the the um, Mars's average temperature is about negative uh, 63, 63 degrees Celsius. And at the poles, it's about a negative 150 degrees Celsius. And the interesting thing is both of these planets also, it's speculated that both of these planets at one point had liquid water on their surface as well, but it's now gone. Um, so Earth's long-term uh, uh, long-term uh, climate stability kind of owes its uh, owes itself to the silicate weathering feedback, right? So this is a negative feedback. So so anytime you change the system, it wants to go back to what it used to be, right? So it's a negative feedback, and it's actually very simple, right? So um, uh, so that's kind of described in this. Uh, figure I've shown you about Paul Hoffman, which is, you know, essentially saying that CO2 is one of the primary controls on Earth's uh, climate, as we're discovering now, you know, with the with the, the burning of fossil fuels. But if we if we talk about sources and sinks of CO2, you know, we have sources from mid-ocean ridges and from volcanic arcs, right, where CO2 is getting released from the mantle uh, and also from sub also from sub um, subducted. Um, subjected sediments, um, and then we have sinks, right? And the two main sinks are organic matter, so plants and trees and uh, forams and all kinds of things that end up on the 
on the on the on the um, ocean floor, uh, but also the major sink is a carbonate rocks, right? So that's calcium, uh, CaCO3, and uh, so those are the main sources and sinks. But the 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 way that the negative feedback comes into play is with the weathering of of uh, the continental crust, right? So when we have CO2 in the atmosphere. And you know you have rain falls through the atmosphere. It dissolves some of that CO2, making uh, 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 carbonic acid. That carbonic acid reacts with the continental crust to create uh, you know magnesium and calcium uh, and potassium cations and bicarbonate, right? And eventually those two things bond together and make uh, limestones, right? And that's the predominant. Uh, uh, storage form of CO2. So the negative feedback comes into play where if the planet gets hotter, um, you then the, the, rate, the, the rate of weathering of the continental crust increases and you sequester more CO2 in the form of limestones. Uh, but now, if we suck CO2 out of the atmosphere, that means the temperature decreases, right? Mm -hmm. And when the temperature decreases, the silicate uh, the, the rate of silicate weathering decreases as well. So it's a negative feedback. So anytime you change a system, it wants to go back the way it used to be. So if we think about the long-term climate uh, of Earth, it's just kind of fluctuating along some mean, right? And, uh, but sometimes this feedback breaks down. And this is what I'll be discussing today, uh, which what we call this, uh, the Neoprotozoic Snowball Earth, where it appears that the whole planet was covered in ice. Um, which is, uh, you know, kind of a, a bizarre thought, but, you know, the more data that we're collecting on this, uh, the more robust it appears. And, and I'll be talking about um, one of these uh, tests of this hypothesis that, that, that I did during my PhD. So let's just quickly, uh, I'll just quickly do some background of Earth's global climate, right? So one of the, the major, the, 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 the predominant trend in, 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 um, on Earth's climate is uh, essentially you're uh, hottest at the tropics and you get colder towards the poles, right? And basically that's just because the tropics are getting more um, radiation from the sun, right, compared to the poles. Um, and this is called the latitudinal, uh, uh, it's called uh, the latitudinal temperature gradient. So this, this is kind of re reflected a little bit in what we see uh, during the last glacial maximum, right? So about 20,000 years ago, the earth was a lot colder than what it is now. And, uh, um, and, uh, and as a result, glaciers uh, grew from the poles towards the tropics, right? Because the tropics is the warmest part and the poles is, is the coldest part, right? Um, so anytime you have warming or cooling of the planet, uh, well, in the case of cooling, uh, ice coverage is going to increase from the poles towards the tropics. The other thing to bear in mind is that uh, the temperature also decreases as we increase in altitude, right? So as we go higher up, uh, you know, temperature, temperature decreases, um, and um, that's called the lapse rate, right? So, uh, yeah. So, and this is kind of shown here. So this is an old figure, but what this shows is this is a, uh, uh, we've got a map where uh, kind of focused on the Northern uh, hemisphere, but in red is shown what the uh, um, extent of, uh, uh, of, of, um, of the continental ice was during the last glacial maximum. So you can see it's, it's it covers a lot of, uh, Northern America. And uh, what we've got on the bottom is a cross section, right? And, and this is going from the North Pole all the way to the South Pole. And we can see Antarctica at the bottom there and the Arctic Ocean at the top on the North Pole. And uh, the black line is the relief. So it's the topography, right? The mountains. And the, um, the red line is the snow line uh, in, the, uh, in the modern day, right? So that's basically how high do you have to go before you start to uh, see snow on the ground, right? And the blue line is what we think the snow line was during the last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago. And you can see basically the altitude uh, that you, 
uh, at which you have to climb to, to, to see ice decrease by about a thousand meters, right? So much of the Andes and much of the mountains in the west coast of the US were glaciated during the last glacial maximum. And that's even in the tropics, which we consider to be very hot, right? Um, so, so that's one key kind of thing to bear in mind is like when the planet's getting colder, ice is going to uh, increase in coverage from the poles toward the tropics, and it's also going to decrease in altitude from higher altitude to lower altitude. Um, so, you know, when we think about the, the more modern uh, history of Earth, there's a whole bunch of different proxies you can use to investigate this, right? Like in one such example is um, oxygen isotopes in a basic forearms, right? But when we go deep into Earth history, like into the Precambrian, uh, that's not the case, right? None of these proxies really work. They're very complicated overprinting relationships and that kind of thing. Um, and we're left with very coarse tools to figure out was the planet hot or was it cold, right? And they're geological, right? So it's what kind of rocks do we find in a particular time period? And in terms of cold rocks, right, we can look for glacial diameter, right? That indicates that there were glaciers nearby that was affecting sedimentation. And in terms of warm conditions, we can think about rocks like limestones, right? So um, if water is warm, that actually helps the saturation of uh, calcium carbonate, right? So in the Bahamas, you know, you're in the tropics, it's really warm, you've got your mojito that you're drinking on the beach and the beach is made up of a carbonate sand right so if we find big thick successions of carbonate that means that you know the planet must have been warm at that point so you know here's an example of a warm environment right so on the right is a photograph of a carbonate uh, beach uh, in the bahamas and on the left is uh these are um stromatolites from shark bay right so this is the last kind of uh, bastion of stromatolites on, on, on Earth's surface. And these are uh, microbial mats or algal mats that are, that are photosynthesizing and growing um, uh, and producing, um, also producing a calcium carbonate. And these are also associated with warm conditions. And, you know, so these are actually two photos from Northern Ethiopia, where on the left, you've got some inclined um, strata. And you can see the tops of stromatolites growing. And then on the right, you've actually got a cross section of some stromatolites that are also growing in this case vertically. So, you know, these are, if we see these in the rock record, we typically interpret this to mean, you know, we're in warm greenhouse conditions. And then in terms of cold conditions, you know, like I said, what we're basically uh, seeing is the presence of glaciers nearby, right? So, uh, you know, um, you might see something like this in the Dwyka uh, group, right, in, in the Karoo, where you have uh, a glacial diamictite, which is basically a sedimentary rock with a wide variety in grain size. So you have very fine mud all the way up to big clasts. And that comes about from the grinding action of glaciers on the continental crust. And importantly, you know, one of the, the key identifiers are what we call drop stones, right? So these are clasts that, that uh fall out of melting glaciers that impact the ocean floor and disturb the bedding. Um, so this kind of, you know, are we hot or are we cold uh, distinction uh, has led to figures like this, right? So this is a figure by Paul Hoffman, where he's basically saying, if we look at the last 3 billion years of Earth history, do we see the presence of glaciers or not? Um, and, and that's basically the three the three categories we're allowed, right? Is there apparently no presence of ice and we must be in a greenhouse environment? Uh, is there perhaps regional ice coverage, right? Such as what we might see um, um, in, for example, uh, uh, in the Dwyka and the Karoo, where we think there's, you know, pretty, pretty large glaciers around Southern Africa, but not globally. Or do we have maybe a snowball earth where we think the whole planet was covered in ice? Right, and so you know, in the Phanerozoic, we've got a number of examples of regional ice coverage, but uh, in terms of snowball Earth, there's only kind of two time periods where we think this happened. The one is in the Paleoproterozoic, and the other is in the Neoproterozoic, about 700 million years ago. And you know, this is a um, an artist's rendition of of what the Earth may have looked like, you know, 720 million years ago. 
Um, so the snowball earth hypothesis kind of started off with this very simple field observation where geologists from around the world were looking in Australia and the United States and uh, uh, Namibia and elsewhere. And what they saw were, uh, so on, on the left is a stratigraphic a column, right? And what they saw was, you know, you'd be walking through these, you know, uh, rocks we typically associate with warm tropical conditions, right? Like stromatolites, dolomites. And then all of a sudden, you're overlain by glacial diamicta, right? And that would be the equivalent of you're in the tropics, uh, going for a swim, and you see a glacier coming over the horizon with like big boulders um, stuck inside, right? Which, which is, is pretty bizarre. Um, and so one key thing that, um, and, and, and essentially what this means is that we've got uh, glaciers in the tropics, right? And if you remember what I said at the beginning, you know, you always get colder when you're going from the tropics towards the poles, right? So if there's glaciers at sea level in the tropics, it means you've got to be colder than that everywhere else. And that's what led to this idea like, okay, the whole planet must have been covered in ice, right? Because if you can sustain glaciers in the tropics, you can sustain glaciers everywhere else. Um, and uh, so one of the key uh, fundamental feedbacks that we think controls this snowball earth concept is the ice albedo feedback, right? But in comparison to the silicate weathering feedback where that was a negative feedback, right? So if you perturb the system, it jumps back to what it used to be. In this case, it's a positive feedback. So if you make a change, it's going to actually accelerate the change. So the more you change the system, the more it changes. And I'll just quickly explain this, right? So on the bottom, we've got what we call a planetary albedo, right? So that's how much of the sun's um, solar radiation, how much of its energy are we reflecting back to space and is not cooling the planet, right? And you know, so we've got kind of three snapshots, right? On the left, we've got like a partially glaciated world, right? And we're reflecting some certain amount of the sun's radiation back to space, right? Now, if, if we cool the planet down and we grow the extent of glaciers around the world, that's actually going to result in more solar radiation getting expelled back to space, right? And more heat getting expelled back to space. And therefore, the Earth cools down more and we grow more ice. Right, and then we move on to the figure on the right where we've grown more ice and that means we reflect more of, of, of sunlight back to space. So it's a positive feedback. So the more we cool, the cooler it want, the earth wants to get. Um, so this leads to why is geochronology a useful tool for investigating this kind of phenomenon, right? And basically it's because this hypothesis and the ice albedo feedback make some very strong predictions that we can test with high precision uh, geochronology. And I'll just explain it by just explaining the figure that we've got here. So on the right, we've got three snapshots of what we think are like the snowball earth uh, trajectory, right? So we start off with some kind of world that's similar like today, right? Where we have glaciers at the poles in Antarctica and the Arctic. And then we have some kind of cooling event the ice coverage, it expands until the whole planet is covered and eventually we deglaciate, right? But on the left, we've got a plot where we've got um, sea surface temperature on the x-axis and, and time on the y-axis, right? So when we're getting hotter towards the right and we're getting colder to the left and time is progressing up on the y-axis, right? And because of the ice albedo feedback, right, the if we have any kind of cooling and, and ice coverage increases, then the cooling accelerates, right? Such that the, it should be really rapid going from partially glaciated to fully glaciated. That should be happened over the course of a few thousand years, right? Which geologically is like instantaneous, right? So that's why when we start at the bottom, you know, maybe we gradually start cooling. And then once we reach some critical threshold, then the cooling really uh, increases and we have this like, basically a, a horizontal line, right? And then slowly, uh, because you've, you've now glaciated the whole planet, you really decrease the amount of, of rainfall. I mean, the, there's effectively no rain, right? There's no evaporation from the ocean. So the amount of weathering of the continental crust goes 
almost to zero, right? So that means we're not weathering the continental crust, which means as volcanoes continue to expel CO2, that CO2 has got nowhere to go. It stays in the atmosphere and it slowly warms the planet up until it gets warm enough that we start to melt ice in the tropics, right? And then as you melt some ice and you reveal the ocean, that ocean is really effective at absorbing the sun's heat, right? And so the ice albedo feedback works in the same way, but in the opposite direction. So the moment you start getting rid of ice, the retreat of ice really accelerates because every time you melt ice, you're exposing some ocean or some of the continents that's really good at absorbing the sun's heat, right? So that's why the deglaciation should also be really rapid. So, so this comes up with a, a really important test here we can make is that the beginning of glacial conditions around the world should be synchronous, right? Because the, the, as the planet rapidly cools, we should have glacial conditions everywhere, right? So if we go to different places around the world with these glacial rocks that we think are related to this event, they should all start at exactly the same age, right? Um, so that's a test that, that, that we did, right? So we were focused on the, um, on the near protozoic snowball Earth. So that's, you know, started at about 720 million years ago. And we refer to it as the Sturdium snowball Earth. And then there's a brief interglacial. And then you go back into snowball conditions in what people call the Maranoan snowball Earth. But we're going to focus on the beginning of the Sturdium. So, you know, there are a number of these glacial dimectites around the world, right? Uh, this is a, a paleogeographic reconstruction from about 715 million years ago. And America is kind of in the middle there. Uh, the Kalahari Craton, you can see I'm, I'm American centric because I, I know where the US is, but I don't know where the Kalahari Craton is on this map. But it's somewhere to the left there. Uh, we've got India on the upper left and China basically directly north. But there's a lot of places where we have these glacial deposits but there's very few where we have any radiometric age constraints, right? We're just kind of estimating what their age is. And uh, so the tool I used was uranium, lead, and zircon. I think everybody's pretty familiar with this, but the method we used wasn't laser ablation. It was uh, thermal ionization mass spectrometry, right? And the way that works is we take individual zircons, we place them in a little Teflon cup that's, that's you know, very small, and then we partially dissolve it. And what that does is it gets rid of any zircon that maybe was like experienced some like open system behavior. So, it, you know, maybe had some uranium or, 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 or lead mobility, right? And then once we've got a, what we think is pristine zircon, we dissolve that and we, uh, we then place that on a, a thin rhenium wire uh, and then we heat it up, basically. We, it's like the same as a light bulb. We run a, a high current through that rhenium wire and we cause the uranium and lead to thermally ionize. So we give them thermal heat and that makes them ionize. And then we can measure those um, uranium and lead isotopes in a mass spectrometer. So the drawback is you can only find zircon in, in felsic volcanic rocks or felsic rocks. So uh, that's the drawback, right? So I'll, I'll go into that uh, a bit later. But um, this is just a summary of all the existing geochronological ge constraints on the beginning of the sturdy and snowball earth. And I'm going to briefly describe why none of them are, are great tests of this like synchronicity, right? Is the, is the glaciation starting at the same time? So we'll start with the first one in a month, uh, which is a date on uh, ash bed, but it's within the dynamic type. So it's, it's, it's only, it's not telling us when it started. It's only, it's just a minimum constraint on when it started, right? The next is in Laurentia, uh, which is the states from Northwest of Canada. And here we've got a date on volcanics, but it's below uh, an unconformity with the glacial rock. So again, we don't know how much time uh, is encapsulated in that unconformity. Um, in South China, there's some dates, but uh, the, the, uh, they were pretty relatively low precision. Uh, so that's not very useful. But then the gold standard is from also Laurentia, where we have a date within the diamectite and a date below in the volcanics. And that actually constrains when we think this sturdium started in uh, Laurentia, or, or, and which is now uh, Northwest Canada. 
So we know in Canada, it started between 717.4 and 716.9 million years ago. So uh, I'll just briefly go over this, right? So, you know, there are a lot of sedimentary basins like what you might find on East Coast US, right? Where it's a passive margin uh, and there's a great uh, sedimentological record of, of climate changes that have occurred there over the last you know, 180 million years, but there's no volcanic rocks, right? There's nothing to date. But if you go somewhere like Japan, right? Into a backhawk basin, you're right next to an active subduction zone, there's volcanoes uh, erupting on a somewhat, you know, somewhat regular basis, you know, there, there's some real potential to find something to date. So we went to basically the equivalent of, of, of Japan, uh, but in this case, it's in uh, northern Ethiopia. So if you look at the uh, Arabian Nubian Shield, it's an assortment of backup basins and, and, and associated sedimentary rocks that were accreted during the Pan-African event, right? So, uh, so that's a great place to go and look for these things. Um, and this is what the stratigraphy looks like in northern Ethiopia. So on the left, I've got a stratigraphic column, and we've got the, um, um, the legend on the bottom, and we've got two field photographs. Um, and essentially, it's kind of the classic snowball earth stratigraphy, where you've got shallow water, carbonate rocks like oolite that I've shown here that's indicative of warm conditions, and it's overlain uh, by a glacial dynamic type. And importantly, we think in Ethiopia that is conformable. We don't, from what we saw in the field, there wasn't any great evidence for big agonite unconformities or, or, or a big, uh, big hi hiatus at that contact. Um, and what's great about this is like with all these shallow water carbonates, we can analyze their jet chemistry, their carbon and oxygen isotopes to you know, also help us uh, say something about global climate. Um, so on the top, we've got two photos of uh, the diamictite. So in this case, these rocks were, were quite deformed, right? They're, they're preserved in a series of, of synclines and anticlines, uh, you know, because these were massively overprinted during the Pan-African. And you can see that there's a strong foliation uh, that's kind of going uh, up and down through the photograph on the top left. But you, you should also be able to make out there's a class of oolite there. And that's another photo on the right of, of what you might see there. It's just a, a kind of class supported conglomerate. And, and again, this is overlying shallow water facies. This is, these are stromatolites, right? So this is kind of the classic snowball earth stratigraphy. So I just quickly, I, I kind of like this because it, it shows you sometimes how hard it is to find ash beds in sedimentary successions, right? So actually in this photo, there are two, there's two ash beds and the, the top one is over there. And actually what made us identify it was there are a tension, I think, I think your correct term is tension gash, um, which we thought, hey, this is telling us that this little layer of rock is, 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 uh, is experiencing strain in a different way to the limestones and the shales around it. So we thought, hey, what's that? And we sampled it. And then actually, if you look at the base of that, we've got a thin section. And you can almost make out these little felsic, uh, uh, little quartz or feldspar uh, grains. But if you look at a thin section, you can actually see the transition from shale or limestone into this um, airfall tuff. And we can see kind of little angular grains or feldspar or quartz. And when you do zircon separation on this, you get these amazing uh, zircons, which look like they were erupted last week. But, uh, and we were able to get some great ages from these, right? So I'll show that here. So we had about three, we had three horizons that we, we were able to date. Two that were very close to each other near the top of the stratigraphy, one at the base. The one at the base was, uh, well, to, uh, further down in the stratigraphy, I won't say base. But we have an age of 735 MA roughly, and then we have an age at the top of roughly 720 MA. Um, but importantly, there's some stratigraphy between our highest dated unit and the dynamic type, right? So we have to account for that sedimentation when we want to estimate the age of the dynamic type here, right? So the way we did that was with the Monte Carlo approach, right? And basically what that is, is, you know, we, when we have these dates, right? We have 735 plus or minus 
something, right? What we can do with a Monte Carlo approach is we just randomly sample that distribution a million times, right? And then we randomly sample one of the distributions at the top, one of these un, un, you know, uncertainty distributions at the top a million times. And we use that to come up with a million deposition rates, right? How many meters per million years did we accumulate between those two ash beds, right? And then we use that, then we, then we have a resulting distribution of deposition rates, right? And then we can basically use those deposition rates to estimate how much time is encompassed by that, you know, 20, 30, 40 meters, I forget how much it was, between our highest ash bed and the diameter. And what that means is that we can come up with an estimate for the age of the diamectite in Ethiopia, right? And that's shown here on the left side in the orange, right? That's the, 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 the distribution of ages that we think is the age of the diamectite in Ethiopia. And we've shown the 95th percentile with those two stippled orange lights, right? And, and just below that are, so, so I guess just to clarify, we've got age on the y-axis and the x-axis here doesn't really mean anything. Um, but we've got individual zircon ages, right? In those little orange lines. And then we've got the weighted mean of those ages uh, with, uh, with short, uh, uh, short black line. And then the gray is the uncertainty on the weighted mean, right? So now I'm gonna show you some of the other ages we got, well, um, ages from around the world for this, for this snowball earth event, right? Um, and kind of critically, Again, do you remember I told you those two dates from Canada, right? We had the one age of 716.9 that was above the, the beginning of the diamectite, and we had an age of 717.4 below the diamectite. So that gives us this blue bar that runs across the screen here. That's what we think is the known, uh, the timing of initiation of the glacial event in uh, northwest, uh, um, uh, northwest Canada, right? And it's actually, Pretty crazy, but it lines up almost exactly with the with the distribution of, of with, with our age estimate that we got from Ethiopia. So in this case, this is a positive text, right? I mean, we, we said, you know, we kind of independently said, okay, how old are these diamectites in Ethiopia? It's completely different terrain. It's got no paleogeographic um, connection with uh, Laurentia and, uh, you know, what is now Northwest Canada. But despite that, the ages line up really well. And... So this means that, you know, this uh, snowball earth hypothesis in this case um, makes sense. Uh, and there's an age from Oman, and then these were the, um, these were uh, some uh, Sims ages from China. And interestingly, after our study, they, uh, the, um, uh, the workers in China, they actually did some Tim's work of their own on those ash beds. And this was their estimate for uh, the age of uh, the Sturdian glaciation in China. And again, this lines up really well. So it's like, wow, okay, this is, um, we're making a pretty strong case that this is this was a real thing, right? Um, and this, this kind of led us, uh, me and some um, of my friends basically at, uh, in the PhD program, you know, we were basically looking for other opportunities to maybe do something similar to this. And, um, and there was one great example, actually, that was very close to where we were at the university in New Jersey. There was a place in uh, Virginia where we could kind of do the same test. And, and the result didn't really fit the model. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain why now. But um, it just so happens that in uh, Virginia, there is a failed roof that's preserved, right? So it's a roof that was active about 750 million years ago, something similar to the East African roof, but it never actually fully resulted in full rifting and like the opening of a new ocean basin, right? It started rifting and then it kind of fell. And that's still preserved in the US today. And there are some glacial sedimentary rocks that are preserved within this rift succession. And uh, this is where so that's so the area of investigation was in this uh, red uh, square, and it's shown on the same area shown with the uh, with the, the the star, and that was the orientation of uh, the the North America and Greenland about 750 million years ago. So America was kind of rotated on its side, and the reason we we uh, went there was because 
as well as being as well as there being these glacial rocks, there were uh, uh, rift related fossil volcanics that were interbedded uh, amongst these glacial rocks. So we and so there were uh, and and what they were were rhyolite domes, right? And rhyolites have tons of zircons. We thought, hey, let's go do this. So um, so this is a geologic map of the area, and the, uh, the 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 glacial rocks in question are called the Conorock Formation. And they're shown in this um, green and dark blue. And then in light blue to the southeast side are, are rift, uh, rift related sediments and volcanics. And on the top left are Cambrian sediments. So there's an unconformity at the base of that uh, pink unit and everything here is dipping towards the Northwest. So everything's getting younger that way. And in these rocks are what we see these um, yellow units, which are rhyolites. And they appear to be eruptive. They've got flow banding. And what we thought is, like, yeah, these are rhyolite domes that were, were being um, deposited as these glacial rocks were also, uh, as glaciers were, 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 were active nearby. And what's also great is that in this area, uh, we could sample these rhyolites in stratigraphic succession. So one of the concerns here was that this area was significantly structurally overprinted during the Phanerozoic. So in the last 500 million years, there were a number of like arc accretion events and deformational events such that we were worried people weren't going to believe us and they were going to say, what this is, is this is an older highlight that got thrust in and, and there's some complication. So what we did was we dated three highlights in succession. And if they get younger going up, then that is a pretty good indication that this is just an undisturbed sedimentary sequence that is now being rotated and is now dipping towards the uh, northwest. Um, so this is on the left, this is what the Conorock formation looks like. So this is a, uh, a photograph of, a, of a, um, a ground down piece of the Conorock formation diamecta. And you can see these like fine laminations as well as a number of like clasts, right? So it's a huge range in grain size. Again, this is like a classic diamond type, right? And there's also what we think are drop stones, right? So there's clasts of various sizes that are puncturing the bedding. This appears that they were dropped out of a glacier. And, uh, you know, so, we, so this is somewhat robust evidence that this was glacial. And on the right is just a photograph from a, a glacial lake that was active um, in the United States about 20,000 years ago, just to show you like, okay, there's no big class on the right, but these fine laminations that look pretty similar. Um, so these are the, so this is the geochronologic data that we got from these, um, from the rhyolites. And in this case, we've got age on the x-axis getting younger that way. Um, and uh, this is no longer in review, it's published, so I need to update my slides. Um, but on the y-axis, we've got uh, the probability, right? And in this case, it's probability of eruption, right? So um, kind of the way that we, people interpret zircon ages kind of what evolved since we published the first paper and people were using like Bayesian models and stuff. So that's what we did in this paper. And, and so what you can see with that histogram on the, in blue is that is a, 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 a distribution of eruption age estimates for these different rhyolite domes, right? And what we can do is take the uh, median and the 95th percentile of that distribution, and that's like our quoted age and uncertainty, right? And so we can do that for those three uh, rhyolite bodies. And this is based on the zircon ages, right? So we take the zircon age distributions for each rhyolite dome, and we end up with one of these age estimates. And what you can see is as you go up the stratigraphy, they get younger, right? So we think that we're uh, preserving stratigraphic uh, continuity, right? There's no major structural overprints. And what this also means is that these, these diamectites are about, you know, 750 million years old because the highest rhyolite dome cross cuts them or is deposited with them and uh, is about 750, right? So that's a very different age to the rest of the ages that we just that I described earlier, right? And and that's shown on the on the plot on the right. We've got age on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is distance of the of the Conorock formation depositional area from the equator, right? So the smaller the, that angle on the y-axis, the closer it is to the e equator. 
And what I've shown is uh, the age of the deposition of the Cronach Formation, which is around about 750. And then on the right, we've got the what we think is the initiation of the Sturdian Snowball Earth, right, at 717 MA. And this is the, uh, the paleogeography of the United States around about that time, 750 MA. And, and what's great is that there's a big sequence of sedimentary rocks that are preserved in the Grand Canyon in the Western United States that people have done paleomagnetic studies on that allows us to constrain where North America was at the time. And basically those two uh, purple lines that cross North America, that's where we think the equator was. Uh, it's two estimates for where we think the e equator was at around about 755 and 750 MA. So we can see that uh, the Connacht Formation was pretty close to the equator at this time, right? Um, and that should worry you, right? Because remember if I said, if there's glaciers in the tropics, then it means there's glaciers everywhere else, right? So we must be in a, a snowball earth, but that's not, we, we know definitively that that's not the case because we have a, a lot of other sedimentary rocks that are preserved elsewhere in North America from this time period that are not glacial, that are just regular carbonates and stuff. And so we know we're not in a snowball earth. So then we had to kind of come up with a way of interpreting this, these ages and their implications in a, in a, in a coherent way, right? And the, the, essentially the story we came up with was that with these uh, glacier rocks that we dated in this failed rift, right? We don't have the necessity that they had to be at sea level, right? If, you, if, if there's like a dolomite or a carbonate or something, that must have been deposited below sea level. But in the case of the Connor Formation, there are lacustrine, there are lake deposits in a rift, and they could have been significantly above sea level. So what we were thinking is maybe what we're seeing is a high altitude lake that was glaciated while at low latitude, low, low altitudes, uh, you had normal kind of non-glacial activity, such as what you see in the, in, in the Andes today, right? Um, so this is, uh, uh, I think this is an image from uh, the space station, but it's just showing you that, you know, that there is significant glacial coverage in South America, but at low altitude, you know, there, there are no glaciers and, and you, you know, you don't, um, yeah. So, and also what you, what's also great about this photograph is you can see that the snow line, right? That's the line at which you first encounter glaciers is, in, is increasing as you go north towards the tropics, right? So down on the southern end of South America, they're close to sea level, right? But then as you go up north towards the tropics, they're getting higher and higher and higher, right? And, uh, but the Andes is not a great uh, geological analog for what we saw in Virginia, right? Because that's a compressional uh, tectonic environment. And we're talking about a, a rift in, uh, a failed rift, right? So a better comparison would be the East African rift, right? So there are lakes in the East African rift that are anywhere from 500 to almost two kilometers altitude above sea level. And what, so what, what our, our model was, well, maybe what we're seeing is, is a glaciated lake in a, in a rift setting similar to what we might see in the East African rift. And actually some of the highest lakes in the East African rift were glaciated uh, during the last glacial, uh, last glacial maximum about 20,000 years ago. So I'll just show this last thing. So this is a, um, a figure that we came up with to try to constrain, well, what do these glacial rocks maybe mean for climate going into the snowball earth, right? And on the x-axis, we've got elevation of the tropical ice line, right? So it's basically how high do you have to go till you, till you, uh, um, till you intersect ice, right? Till you intersect glaciers. And on the y-axis, we've got the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the tropical sea surface temperature, right? So how hot is the ocean in the tropics? And these diagonal lines that I'll be showing, that's the lapse rate, right? So that's basically how cool uh, how fast do you cool as you go up, right? So 5.5 degrees Celsius per kilometer, that's the modern lapse rate, right? That's, if I go up one kilometer, my temperature decreases by 5.5 degrees. 
Um, so let's start with the Cretaceous, right? So, so we know during the Cretaceous, the sea surface temperatures in the tropics was about 35 degrees Celsius, right? So that means that there, the glaciers, there would only be glaciers at altitudes in excess of six kilometers, right? So only the highest mountains in the tropics would have any kind of glaciers, right? Um, so then you've got to ask yourself, well, what's the preservation potential, right? How likely is it that some lake sediments on one of the highest mountains on the world in, on earth is going to be preserved in the geologic record, right? Well, it's pretty low. Um, oh, but if we go to say, for example, the last glacial maximum, right? The sea surface temperatures were about 25 degrees Celsius and the lapse rate was steeper, right? So every time you decrease the amount of water vapor in that atmosphere, the rate at which you cool uh, increases dramatically because water vapor basically stores energy. So the more uh, water vapor in the, in the air, the more heat you can transport to higher altitudes and the slower you cool down, right? So if you, if you, if, if you cool the earth down, you reduce the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere, then the rate at which you cool increases. So during the last glacial maximum, we think we were cooling at about 6.7 degrees Celsius per kilometer. And in that case, you know, you can have glaciers all the way down to say three kilometers of altitude. Um, and then the last case is say, say we say, what's the maximum, right? Say we, we, we cool the planet dramatically so that it's cooler than the last glacial maximum. Well, then you can have lapse rates that are higher, right? At 9.8 degrees Celsius. And you can have glaciers all the way down to sea level, right? Um, and then just for comparison, this is the altitude of major lakes in the East African Rift, right? So, you know, so look, there's, there's no major lakes that are at four or five or six kilometers altitude. And what are, one other constraint is we can't get too cold, right? Because if the tropical sea surface temperatures reach about 10 or 15 degrees Celsius, then we're going to have our runaway ice albedo effect and the whole planet's going to become glaciated. So it can't be, so basically what we're saying is the planet must have been really cold, but it couldn't have been too cold because otherwise you go into the stable earth state. And just for comparison, this is like, this is the altitude of Lake Titicaca, which is a massive lake in the, in the Andes mountains that is what, that is still uh, partially uh, glaciated today. So that was kind of our, 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 uh, uh, hypothesis are like, wow, the planet must have actually been really cold before this noble earth. And, 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 you know, um, for, for tens of millions of years before the snowball earth. And it wasn't, it wasn't like this on off switch, like, oh, we go from completely ice free to like completely ice covered. There may have been some slow transition, you know, or, or maybe some slow cooling followed by some really uh, late rapid cooling to get you into the snowball earth, but it seems unlikely that we're in this like greenhouse world with no ice and then we suddenly go into completely ice covered. Uh, yeah, and then, yeah, uh, I'll just, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. That was a brilliant talk. Really, really interesting, fascinating, and I think shows the importance of high precision uranium lead ages. Never underestimate them. Okay, so do we have any questions from the audience here in the room? To begin with, I see Lou's hand is already up on Zoom, but do we have any questions here? At the back. Yes, you're going to have to speak. Maybe you can come to the front, actually, so the Zoom microphone can hear you. Sorry to do that to you. <laughs> Put you on the spot, yes. That's the way it's got Then everyone can hear you online. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Should I ask them or ask you? No, no. Oh, but, but, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so my question is on, on the snowball earth. So since we say that um, the whole earth was covered in ice, I want to know how, how did that affect the, the rate of the tectonic movement? Did it like accelerate or did it like this, did it like slow down? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. I, I actually had not thought about that before. I mean, my, my suspicion is not much, um, you know, because, you know, you're gonna have a lot of like, you know, 
a lot of mass added to the continental crust. Um, but I don't think that's going to affect like uh, the rate of like subduction of the oceanic crust. So, um, but yeah, I mean, may, uh, that's a great question, but I haven't thought about it. But I, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think one thought is maybe during the deglaciation. Um, yeah, I don't know, Roger. No, I'm not. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought you, you, you had a thought about that. No, I mean, that's a good question, but my, my suspicion is not much because also on the on the oceans, the ice is not like riding on the oceanic crust. It's it's floating on the ocean. So the oceanic crust is still gonna kind of just do its thing. Um, mm -hmm. but in turn, but I mean actually an interesting point is you know how much sediment is getting to the subduction zone that does affect subduction rates right so if you're putting a lot of like weak material and it's being eroded from the continents and getting into the subduction zone that can affect like subduction rates and maybe that slowed maybe there was less sediment being delivered to the uh to to offshore and to subduction zones on a global scale yeah that's interesting okay we'll uh, go to roger Thanks, Scott. So, so just to follow on that question, what, um, what do you think is the reason for these things happening at, at, at those times? I mean, is it that there's a drop in, in volcanism on Earth, maybe related to plate tectonics, preceding it? Or is it something solar system or larger scale Earth's position yeah. uh, and so on? And then you know, why then would you get the, the, the Maranoan event straight afterwards and then nothing? Yeah. Uh, so why does it repeat uh, and then disappear? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, those are like active research questions. But I mean, those are so. So yes, some of my thoughts, right? So one is so there's a lot of different ideas for what started it, and it can vary from things like you know, if you say you have a large igneous province that's uh, erupted in the tropics, um, you know, when you weather mafic rocks, you're delivering a lot of uh, magnesium, iron, and calcium into the oceans, which results into a, a lot of uh, production of limestone. So that was one thought is like, maybe we had a large igneous province in the tropics that was weathering, sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere. And that was like the, uh, the mechanism that started a global glaciation. Um, but yeah, no one's got like a bulletproof answer for that. Um, and What's interesting is a lot of the, the the conditions needed to get you into that real isobeta feedback, right? Where you, that that initial rapid cooling. You read the planet. All the models uh, require the planet was already pretty cold. So uh, a lot of the modeling that people did, like okay, this was now 15 years ago, but you know they require CO2 levels of like 150 ppm, which is like less than the last glacial maximum. So that's actually kind of consistent with, with what we were saying. Um, but uh, but yeah, there's not like a, a bulletproof. And then what was your second question was the um, the one was, what was the mechanism? And then why do you go to deglaciation followed by a shorter uh, full glaciation again? And I think that's a great question. I mean, the the um yeah i mean there's there's a few proposals my thought was you know maybe it's it's uh uh something to do with like you're scouring um the continental crust during the first glaciation so you're like you well this is not my idea but this this is like other other people's idea but it's like maybe during the first snowball you're like the glaciers are scouring the continents and you're like ex exposing a lot of fresh uh material that can be weathered and and um but but yeah okay let us know your name because you don't formally there's the microphone you have to speak into the microphone this way yeah so uh first of all my name is mary talk louder please for the audience <laughs> <laughs> good, good yeah, question don't be it's well. great questions yeah <laughs> So my question is, is there any evidence from Southern Africa to support your hypothesis? Because I noticed that this research was based on the Northern Hemisphere, like North America, 
China yeah. and all that? No, that's a great question. So, so there's a lot of amazing rocks in like Namibia, for example, and actually uh, in the Northern Cape. Uh, but the Northern Cape's received much less attention. Namibia, there's like amazing exposures, but there's the, you don't have stuff to date there. In Namibia, it's a passive margin, at, at least during this period of, uh, of the geologic record, like 750 to 700, it's a passive margin and you've just got sedimentation, but you don't have volcanoes nearby that allows you to like do the geochronology. But, but um, yeah, but, uh, but there, there are some interesting uh, things that we could do in Southern Africa to help with this debate. Yeah, for sure. Great question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're gonna go for Ben, and then Rui, and then Sharon, and then Lou, and Sue. We haven't forgotten about you. So Ben, go for it. Uh, Sorry, Scott, just a question, just a question based on the Virginia case study. I think it was about 30 million years before the Sturtian glaciation yeah. snowball over. Can you sort of comment on, you're suggesting that the Earth was maybe teetering on the edge of a snowball Earth at that time, uh, about seven billion. Yeah. So how many other examples could there be in Earth's history of that kind of process happening? It's verging on snowball Earth, yeah. but it doesn't quite happen. Is that more frequent than what is known, or is it? Well, that's, I mean, I think that's uh, that's something I personally want to pursue going forward, because a lot of these dimectites, there was a stratigraphic correlation done. So people were like, um, part of the assumption was like, if there's a dimectite and it's in the Neoproterozoic, it probably is from this time period. It probably correlates with the snowball earth. But uh it's kind of an open question i think you know potentially a lot of them like i was actually talking to somebody at wits maybe who was saying there's now some examples of of the uh like another kind of snowball ish episode is at uh, 580 ma i didn't really discuss it here but but now there's dates of a, of a younger glaciation that's more like 550 and so i, I think as there's more work done we might find that there's a much larger age distribution and some of the more kind of stratigraphic or litho like kind of some of the some of the stratigraphic assumptions might not hold up and then it might be like look uh we're gonna have to think more deeply about what was this like actual true climate evolution of of, of earth yeah okay Rui, do you want to come closer to the microphone Yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question was about the ages in Virginia. Um, basically, what you said is if we find three ages that from uh, east to west are one uh, younger than the other, then it means that they are pretty much in the right stratigraphic order. That's what you found, and that's why you interpreted uh that's as actual sedimentary ages but what if since uh, the whole sequence is tilted uh like uh, in uh, with a east-west deformation what if they were actually uh modified so uh, uh biased by metamorphism but they the metamorphism happened in such a sequence that it looks like they are in a stratigraphic order. So what if this metamorphism happened like first in the west and then in the east? And so the uh, and the, it ended first in the west and then in the east. So the youngest age you find is in the west, but just that because that was the last, the first metamorphism to end. Uh, uh, well, you know, yeah. something like that. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. Uh, and and so for example, but so if you were if we were doing like argon argon geochronology that we would maybe have to worry about that it's like what you know is there some what's the temperature history of that part of the crust and are there some overprinting events but the reason we don't have to worry about that is that zircon um basically you have to essentially melt zircon before it's really affected by uh by the, by the metamorphism uh the lead diffusion in zircon is like super slow so, so, Zirc so that's kind of the beauty of zircon is that once you, once you're producing lead in a zircon, it's basically stuck. Like it, it, um, I mean, there's obviously some complications, 
Uh, but 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 yeah, but that's a great question. I mean, with something like organ organ or potassium organ ages or or some other system where you don't have the same assumption about closed system behavior, yeah, that would uh, yeah that would be a massive concern. Thank you, Rui. Sharon, nice and loud if you can, Sharon. Okay. Um, I'm gratified to, to see a date about the corner of formation, which I've actually visited that in Mount Rogers, uh, yeah. in Virginia, um, and that they're showing much younger dates than the, the rest of the global Earth. Because this brings up a debate that we had in 2002, it's a long time ago, when we had the International Segmentological Congress here in Johannesburg. At that time, you already mentioned that everybody who saw a diabetes in the Neoporozoic assumed that it was all the same age and related to the Neoporozoic glaciation. And so uh, there were people like Grant Young and others who were arguing that there are some Neoporozoic successions, such as the Port Escape Formation in Scotland and several others, which showed evidence for a hydrological cycle. There were glaciations and there was you know, water laying sediments and so on. That means that there was not a total storm of Earth, right? And they used that to argue that there was no snowball Earth. They were saying all of these glaciations, this new are just local glaciations and so on. Now, I stood up and argued that actually the snowball Earth episode is a very short lived episode during the Neoporozoic, right? It's only a few million years. And we look at the Earth today. There are lots of glaciers. You showed all the all the Andean glaciations. There are lots of glaciers that are not related to snowball earth, but they're related to high elevation. Yeah. And they may be related to rift margins as well, as you, you pointed out. Which means that even in the Neoporozoic, where there were rifts going on, and this is the arguments that other people have made as well, that there was a zipper rift story about the, you know, the yeah. whole Pangea uh, uh, breaking up and so on. So Aside from the snowball Earth story, where the whole world was glaciated all at once, and the whole ocean froze over, there must have been other rifts with high elevations, with glaciations which are localized, not related to snowball Earth. And this one is one of them, right? Yeah. There must have been many others. Exactly, yeah. No, no, I mean, yeah, I, I, uh, I totally agree. And, and uh, um, yeah, I mean, you know, we might find with more analysis of with more data, we might have to like revisit the snowball earth hypothesis and, 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 um, you know, and yeah, I mean, like, but on the other hand, it, it, it is compelling that there's high precision dates from China, uh, Northern Canada and now Ethiopia that like all match up within like a million years, you know? So that's also, um, well, Strong the, evidence, the, right? The point I'm trying to make is that these other glaciations that have been used as evidence against the water have not been as precisely dated as the ones we have just done. Yeah. Right? Which means if you did date them and they fall outside this little bracket of yours, then they're not so well at glaciation. Totally. Ah, oh, 100%. Yeah. 100%. Thank you, Sharon. That's a fantastic comment. All right, Lou, you've waited patiently. Uh, you can unmute and uh, we should be able to hear you. Okay, um, my question is basically the same as the very first question you got today, um, which I guess you pretty much already answered, so I, I don't need to ask it again. But um, instead, I'll tell you an anecdote. Uh, many years ago, Paul Hoffman told me that uh, the inside of the earth does not give a damn uh, uh, during a snowball uh, earth. The inside of the earth still continues to operate uh, as if there was no snowball earth. So tectonics is still going on, mid-ocean ridges, subduction, plumes, whatever, magmatism is, is going on uh, un unaffected. Uh, and I, I guess, I guess you, you kind of think that's pretty much the case also. Um, so some time ago, uh, a group of my friends and I were were studying uh, the granites of the Seychelles, which is 750. And we built a case that this was an Andean type arc. And then we followed it into, uh, into Madagascar, 
and we followed it into India and we sort of did paleo mag on it and we were able to, um, you know, to figure out where this Andean arc was with respect to continental reconstructions at that time. And that, that story came out to be pretty self-consistent, which we were happy with. It was only until, until after all of our papers were published did I, did I realize, I didn't even think about it, but all of these rocks are forming when the earth uh, is in snowball conditions. And so could this have had any effects upon anything to do with the rocks we were studying? And I'm not really sure I know the answer yet, but um, one possibility is that a lot of these rocks have very low um, magmatic uh, delta 18O signatures. So low, low 18, which is a, a pet love of Chris Harris. And so, uh, you know, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure we did anything about it, but um, it, it kind of makes sense that a snowball earth might have some uh, influence over oxygen isotopes in in water and maybe in subduction or something like that. So yeah, you don't have to respond to that, but it's just an interesting story. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember with the, uh, the oxygen, because you, you, if you, you, you're uh, putting, um, I'm trying to remember if you're putting 18 or 16 on the continents, uh, you put me on the spot here, Lou. But uh, what is it? So you, the first thing to rain out is the 18. Um, so the, what is the continents? The, the continental ice sheets on re, are a reservoir of 18. Yeah, so, so the ocean is going to be uh, low 18. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's going to be 16 enriched. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I think I recently read a paper uh, proposing this for the, for the, well, maybe Chris was a co-author, but, but you know, I mean, I, yeah, I think it's interesting. And then, I mean, something, I haven't really done this thought experiment until uh, right now, but, you know, it's like, what happens if you put like three kilometers of ice on the continents, like, uh, or in an arc, and then, you know, what does that do for, like, does that have no effect on like melting regimes and arcs, or when you melt that ice, and then you have isostatic rebound is do you like increase melt production i yeah it's it, but i mean i think it's a bit naive to say that the hydros that the hydrosphere and like the interior of the earth have no or, or how do you say it? the 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 outside and has no effect on on internal internal processes yeah so that'd be interesting oh shit sorry okay we'll end off at that point on uh, on sue's question Sue, you can come through, uh, and then any the questions they can ask at the. Lou, uh, put yours down. Hi. Um, so I'm going to take the opposite tact and ask about the influence of the core, and the magnetic field, and you know, there's a lot of controversy right now about when the inner core actually formed, and yeah. so one of the ideas is um, that the inner core only started um, coalesce or or forming at about 545, but prior to that, the magnetic field was dying off um, very rap well, for, for many, many years. And could that, you know, that could be another mechanism for looking at for this cooling of the earth because it was going on for quite a long time. Um, so I, I just wanted to ask if, you know, have you done any or worked with anyone doing the paleo mag on a lot of these, not so much paleo mag, but paleo intensity and that's something we're working on with um, some of the Bushfeld work. So just to put that out there as another hypothesis. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, I know of people working on like paleo intensities in the, in the Ediacaran kind of Cambrian, uh, looking for this, like, you know, what, what is the paleo intensity doing at that point? I mean, um, well, one, one interesting thought experiment would be, is there anything weird happening in the core at like 2.4, um, 2 right? During the, what we think was the previous, there was one other episode where we, where we think we had like global glacial conditions. So, so it'd be interesting to think about, is there, 
is there some chemical reaction or something that's happening in the core at that or you know some consistent idea uh happening at both time periods but um yeah no yeah, I mean, but yeah, the, the, the formation of the inner core is actually really controversial because, you know, at, at its current growth rate, it would have taken over the whole core. So, you know, there and there's definitely an inner inner core that we see with seismology. So, you know, there, there's all kinds of interesting feedbacks. And um, I think looking at paleo intensity is going to really be an interesting connection there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm oh. Great. Thank you for all the interesting questions and discussion. I think it's a reflection of a really fascinating talk. So thank you, Scott. And uh, yeah, another round of applause. I have to get Scott another beer because I still feel it. Um, but let me just tell you about the talk for next week, which is by another one of our staff members, Dr. Nong Kuselo Matlakana. And she'll be talking about the power, versatility, and pitfalls of automated mineralogy the WITS teamer and the automated mineralogy lab that we have in the department. So hope you'll join us for that. Same place, same time. And thank you once again to John Hancock for the drinks and chips. <laughs> <laughs>